So what you've just described is correct when you are defining that the vessel has arrived in a port or at a berth or has been given free pratique, health clearance, or customs clearance. But you are forgetting the all-important last two letters, O-N, or not. And what this means, for example, with WIPON, is that whether or not, meaning whether or not, the vessel is in the port, we have to define where and what is a port. I'll do that in a minute. But assuming she's in an area controlled by the port authority, she is apparently in the port. But even if she's not in the port, the master may tender notice of residence. Again, that does not mean that she can do that the master can do so when the ship is halfway across the ocean, obviously. But she does not necessarily have to be in the area of the port if an area outside is also under the control of the port authority. And with Wibon, the master should only tender NOR under a birth charter party when the vessel is at the birth. But with Wibon, the master may tender the notice of readiness whether the vessel is in birth or not. So she does not need to be at the berth, tied up alongside, all fast, as we say, before the master can tender a notice of readiness, if and only if we have the Wibon clause. If there is no Wibon clause and it's a birth charter party, not a port charter party, a birth charter party, the master may only tender NOR when the vessel is at the berth. With WIFPON, you are right to describe this as free critique as in health clearance. But the beauty of WIFPON is, beauty as far as an owner is concerned, that even if the vessel has not been given health clearance or free pratique, even if that has not yet happened, the master may still tender the notice of readiness. And the same is true of WECON with customs clearance. Freedom to the master to tender wherever the vessel may be within obvious um, limits. Um, because he may tender whether in or not, whether or not he's there. He mm -hmm. may still tender. It is exactly as you said, freedom to the master to do much more than he could otherwise if the letters or not on were not part of that clause or subclause. you said why is this so it is to give more freedom more flexibility more options to the master representing the ship owner to do whatever is right for the ship let me repeat that a ship owner earns nothing when the ship is in port the owner only earns money by way of something called freight, when the ship is carrying cargo at sea. So the more leeway, the more freedom, the more opportunities there are for the owner not to be restricted, the better for the owner. That's why we have these. The charterers are often not in control of the port or the cargo handling facilities. They will often be traders who are buying from a supplier and selling to a receiver, as many traders are sitting in the middle between the two, between the supplier and the receiver. So charterers who are traders will very often say, well, any delay in the port, it's not my problem, it's not my fault. Wrong. Under a charter party, that's wrong. You need to remember, think of it as this way. Imagine I have three arms, I have two, like most people, but imagine I have one, two, three arms or hands. The charterer has a contract with the ship owner and there are only two people involved in this contract, this charter party contract, the owner and the charterer. If the delay is not the ship's fault, it must be the charterer's fault because there's nobody else involved. The charterer wearing his trader's hat buying from a supplier or selling to a receiver will have separate commercial contracts which have nothing to do with the charter party contract that he has with the owner. So the question of 
delay, for example, the question should always be, is this problem ship's fault? If it is the ship's fault, the late time clock stops. If it's not the ship's fault, the late time clock continues because it must therefore be the charterer's problem. Even if the charterer says, well, it's not mine. I have nothing to do with this particular, I'm just buying cargo. Under this contract, which is what we're talking about, the charter party, it is not the ship's problem or ship's fault. It must be down to the charterer, who may then pass the blame to one or another of the commercial partners. Shifting between birth one and birth two, or between birth two and birth three, are at the charterer's request, because they want the vessel to load or discharge at more than one terminal, more than one berth. Therefore, shifting between terminals or between berths will be for the charter's account, not only in terms of time, so the late time clock will not stop between berths, yeah. but also in terms of cost. Now, either the charters will pay for the bunkers and the pilots and so on, or the owners will do so, and the owners will then pass on that part of the disbursements, the port expenses, to the charters for them to pay for the vessel to shift from birth one to birth two, etc. But now coming back to your earlier question about anchorage to first birth, the first shifting, as you called it, this is a bone of contention with many people, partly because they don't really understand. If the berth had been available when the vessel first arrived at the port, the vessel would have steamed straight in to that berth, been passed alongside and started working, loading or discharging. But if that berth was not available, then the ship could not go directly to the berth. She would have had to interrupt her navigation by dropping anchor. Okay. So the vessel drops anchor in the seabed, somewhere in the Port Authority area, maybe at the mouth of a river, somewhere safe, which is nowhere near the berth. And she will wait there. And there is a berth wait clause in many charter parties, which states that when the vessel is waiting for a berth, that is not the owner's fault, and therefore waiting for a berth will count as late time, once the usual six hours clause has kicked in, as I've explained before. Then, after, let's say, two days, the berth becomes available, and the master is told, ship to shore radio, please, Captain, will you come in now? So from the moment that the anchor is free from the seabed, when she's making way, and then with the engine switched on, she's underway, until the vessel then reaches that berth, until she's all fast, that shifting time, navigating effectively from the anchorage area to the berth, that shifting time does not count, usually not count as late time, because in it, it is an extension of, it is a continuation of the otherwise interrupted navigation. So had the berth been available, the ship would have gone straight to the berth. The berth was not available, so the ship's navigation was interrupted for, in my example, two days, it might be a few hours. And then the navigation continued. So that shifting tends not, usually not, to count. However, you need to read very carefully the exact words in Lord Reed's judgment in the Johanna Oldendorf 1973 case, which is very important which covers this point as well, and there is still a lot of discussion uh, about exactly what Lord Reed mentioned in his judgment in that case. And I don't have time now to go through the ins and outs and the niceties of what he might or might not have meant. I can tell you that the usual understanding is what I've just described, which is that Shifting from anchorage to first birth, or what you have called first shifting, tends not to count as lay time because it is deemed to be, it is considered to be, an extension of navigation. However, if we had another three hours to spare, which we don't, 
I could go in detail into looking at exactly what Lord Reed said in his judgment. If you're interested, go and look at the Johanna Oldendorf, J-O-H-A-N-N-A, -N -N Johanna Oldendorf, well-known German owners. And that case is one of the key cases in this particular regard, and it's from 1973.